go further. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. This is the second webinar in our series, Agritourism and Direct Sales, Best Practices in COVID Times and Beyond. And this webinar series, uh, eight webinars coming at you. This is funded by the USDA Farmers Market Promotion Program grant, and we are happy to be here. I'm Penny Leff. I am the Agritourism Coordinator with the University of California Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. And I'll be hosting today. Co-hosting is Kamyar Aram, and Kamyar is with UC Cooperative Extension, Contra Costa and Alameda counties. And he will be moderating the chat. Our, we have two experienced former UPIC operator speakers with us today. We have Alexis Coco with Soul Food Farm. Uh, correct me if I said your name wrong, Alexis, I'm sorry. Uh, and we have Cindy Lashbrook with Riverdance Farm. And Soul Food Farm is in near Vacaville in Solano County. And Riverdance Farm is in Livingston, Merced County. And um, let's see, uh, Zoom, we are in a Zoom webinar today. So we don't see all of you attending, but we're very glad you're here. Um, if you want to uh, use your, your chat or your Q&A to talk to, to each other and to talk to us, if you have questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to go up into the right, uh, top right and view, and you can see uh, the gallery view or the speakers. And um, today's webinar is on best practices for UPIC operations during times of COVID and beyond. And um, this webinar will be posted on the UC Serap website. So you'll be able to see it. We will be posting a recording of the webinar and we will also be posting um, the slides. So you don't have to scribble and write down all the slides. Uh, so I'm going to move in right now. I'm going to, I'm going to start with a little, um, general presentation about UPIC operations and specifically what you want to do for a UPIC operation in time of COVID, uh, which is slightly different. And then we will hear from our experienced speakers who will tell you how they ran their UPIC operations before and during COVID. So, um, Let's see, we are going to go to here. And I am going to go to here. And here and here. So you pick operations in time of COVID and beyond because we're going to get out of this. Um, you pick is a wonderful way to meet your customers, to encourage them to come out to your farm. And it's a very good entry point into agritourism. You uh, pick is something that you can get into without a whole lot of trouble. You pick is wonderful for uh, berries, for fruit, uh, for things that customers enjoy picking. Uh, doesn't work so well for vegetables, but some people do vegetable you pick also, as you'll see. Okay, let's see. Sorry. All right, basically you pick is allowed by right in most counties in California. 
or you can start a UPIC operation with a very low fee administrative permit or a zoning permit, they're sometimes called. Even though it's generally allowed, you will want to check with your county or city planning department because even if it's allowed without a permit to have you pick on your farm, other things you'll want to know, other things you'll want to do, um, you'll have to provide parking on your site, you'll probably have to deal with find some accommodations for people with disabilities. You might have your hours and your signs restricted. You might need to pay attention to your driveways and your entrance ways. Um, when you are getting into you, there's a whole lot of things that you're going to want to think about. And uh, you will hear more from the farmers how they dealt with these. So I'm going to tell you in general, you want to think about what crops you want to sell, um, how you're going to lay out your farm. Uh, make sure you have good quality, good service, uh, you're communicating well with all your people, you're doing your promotions, you're meeting all your, your requirements, you've got to do a budget, you've got to think of your staffing and your food safety and your risk management and your pricing and all these things before you get into starting a UPIC operation. And here's a guide to help you do that. This is a guide that's available on the UCANR California Agritourism website. There's a link to it. And there's a link to the specific guide that goes through all the different things you'll think about when you're doing agritourism, when you're doing your UPIC operation on your farm. Um, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's different when you're doing UPIC during times of COVID. Now, farms have been declared essential, essential operations, which means you're allowed to offer UPIC during COVID, but there's a, some specific safety precautions that you need to take. You definitely need to keep your customers six feet apart from each other. You need to limit the number of customers so that you can keep them six feet apart from each other. You'll want to have a customer flow that has a very clear entry and exit. You'll want to mark, if you need to, on the, on the floor near your check-in space where you're uh, for your six feet marks to keep people apart. You need to have signs and clearly tell them what are the rules and the procedures for picking. And your staff, everybody on the farm is gonna to wanna to reinforce your rules verbally. When you have families coming, you have to make sure the families keep their children with them and don't go wandering around and socializing with other families because you're supposed to keep the families apart. And you want to not let people hang out don't give them places to sit. Don't expect them to hang, kind of move them through as quickly as you can with still being friendly and social. You will want to post signs with all these safety and hygiene guidelines. Uh, either you can post posters or signs and here's a, um, a website where you can find the appropriate signage. And all of this is going to be posted on the website, so you don't need to um, you don't need to scribble it all down. It'll be there for you to look up. Uh, you will need to provide some kind of hand washing stations and hand sanitizer stations in your UPIC. This hasn't always been required, but during COVID, it is. And you'll want to remind your customers not to touch everything, only to touch what they're going to pick, and if they pick it, it's theirs. Uh, customers will want to adhere to all the, all the rules, your state and local requirements for wearing face coverings or masks. If you can and it's appropriate, uh, you should put up some of those plexiglass shields in front of your cashiers to keep your cashiers safe and uh, keep them from excessive contact from people. And you'll also want to keep your employees that are accepting payment to be different people from those who are handling produce, if it's at all possible to do that. I know it's not always possible to do that. And so if it's not possible, just 
have frequent hand washing and sanitizing between your, your transactions. And in general, you want to be very frequent about sanitizing your tables and all your surfaces and all your equipment. Um, one thing different during COVID, if possible, give your customers single use bags to pick into. If that's not possible, you'll have to be very careful and sanitize your buckets between or your picking containers between each use. And this is real important. And st store your bags or containers or boxes away from the customers so they can't pick through them. They don't pick their own. Give them a their container that they're going to do. And a suggestion is to hand out the harvest containers at the registration or point. What some people, uh, some you pick farmers have decided works well is they have boxes or bags that they sell to the customers, a $5 box or a basket or a $10 bag. And then the customer picks directly into that and nobody else has to touch it. And you don't have to weigh it at the end. They've already got their, their bag or their box and they just fill it that way. You don't want to use tablecloths because they're hard to clean. Uh, you don't. You want to think carefully and don't display items or don't put up all your fancy displays that you used to have. Just keep it very clean and simple and different. And uh, you can't do all the fun stuff anymore that you used to do with your UPIC. You can't have entertainment and crafts during COVID. Uh, or hay rides, but if you need to have transportation to um, to get people out there, uh, you can do that. If you need to have a hay ride to get them out to the picking field, that's all right. And no sampling is is allowed anymore. Um, some extra things you'll probably want to think about is a way for people to get your product. If they're high risk, if you're going to pick for them and just sell it to them on your at your farm stand or do curbside pickup or pre order or have special time when you have a whole lot less people there and you might want to think about donating extra extra produce you have to people who need it continue to accept DBT and this is very important. Make sure you communicate to your customers about all these extra steps you're taking to keep them safe, either with signs or in your social media or however you communicate with your customers. And if it's possible, you might want to consider having pre-registration or scheduling times for people to come in order to uh, reduce your customer flow. So that's what I have to say. And uh, this is, as I say, this is part of a webinar series and um, we'll tell you more about the rest of the webinar series at the end. So next we are going to hear from Alexis Kofod of Soul Food Farm. So Alexis, you are on and I will share your pictures in just a second. There you are, Alexis. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Penny. Um, I'm Alexis. I own a small family farm in Vacaville, and we do for three years now, um, two prior to COVID and one last year during COVID um, for our lavender fields. So I wanted to start off by saying that, um, you know, we often think of new pick as a way to increase farm activity, move crops, or um, increase a, some cash flow potential that's pretty passive. You know, people are coming to our properties to um, buy directly from us. But what I've learned in the last years of doing you pick is that really the biggest um, management concern is managing people and the people who come to the farm. They're not used to being on farms typically. Um, they may not know all the ins and outs of what it means to be out in rural communities and even how to pick a crop or how crops grow. So I found from the beginning of an inception of the idea of you pick to the very end, 
when people are walking away from the UPIC with their product. It's all about managing people. So um, I do this UPIC every year for our Lavender Field with my business partner, Rose Lovell Sale, who owns Morning Sun Herb Farm. And um, the field sits on about mm, three acres. It's a few thousand plants. There's definitely space and wide alleys between the rows for um, to deal with COVID concerns. So lots of social distancing potential there. Um, I agree with Penny completely that you try to keep groups together, but again, that's management and it's not easy to keep small kids from running around, but um, it, it, it is possible. So I'll, I'll work through that as, as I continue. So um, the four sort of goals of you pick that I've come to um, figure out is one, you know, you're doing it because you want to encourage new customers or increase your customer base. Um, you're trying to increase passive cash flow. Um, you're trying to uh, create a lasting experience that will endear customers to agriculture, to your farm and to rural communities. And the basic bottom line is you wanna sell your crop. And this is sort of the, the best dollar value because you're not selling wholesale. You're not delivering to um, a farmer's market where you're trying to get some retail dollars. This is just the best of both worlds. Customers are coming onto your property and there's minimal packaging or harvesting required because people are sort of harvesting for you. Um, so those are the positive aspects of why you would even want to do a you pick in the first place. Um, there's three ways uh, to set up these kinds of um, enterprises. And I'm going to go through them. I've written notes because it just helps me stay focused. So if I'm glancing down a lot, it's because I want to just stay on point with the things that I thought were imperative to convey. So um, what I think is really essential from experience is before your event even begins, when you're at the sort of the, the idea of it and you're going to launch it, is to make sure that in every marketing element that you have, you are repeating the essential components of the UPIC, which is the date, time, location, and if there's a cost. And it sounds like such an obvious thing to do, but after farming for the last 22 years, I've realized like you have to tell people everything repetitively, even if it's on your postcards, Facebook, Instagram, and whatever else you're using as social media to talk about what you're doing. You, people will still ask you the same questions, even if it's in front of their nose on a piece of paper or a postcard. So for your benefit, to your benefit and ease, you can just simply redirect the customer back to whatever um, is, is the announcement for your you pick. And that's sort of the beginning of, of management. You can, if you don't start managing your people and your visitors from the very beginning, you will be completely worn out. And maybe at the end of your UPIC, you'll just think it's too much work. It's not worth it. But the, the point is, is that it really is worth it. You just have to get used to the fact that you're going to deal with people and you have to, you have to sort of make the shoot very narrow so they can just walk through and everything's really explained to them clearly. So um, repeat, repeat, repeat all the information about the essential aspects of coming to your UPIC on print or social media. You can't say it too many times, I promise you. It's, you won't overstate it um, because people will still at the end ask you. Um, so uh, the next one that I think is really important is, um, and I think Penny touched on this a little bit, was um, setting up a pre-registration on your website for people to register to come to your farm. And COVID is kind of an interesting, um, situation because what was a dilemma actually created some new ways of doing things here at RUPIC that I think will carry on even after we're past this pandemic. And this idea of pre-registering people to come on the farm, I think is gold. It's a wonderful way for you to manage the flow of people on your property, to know how many people are arriving, how to prepare, um, to manage the parking on your property for however many vehicles are coming to really schedule it. So if you want 30 people an hour or a hundred people every um, hour with maybe a half hour in between to get a reorganized, it really, I just think it's 
the best way to not be caught off guard and to help people actually have a good experience because you are in charge and you can decide for yourselves um, how much um, intensity you want to have as an experience that the you pick or if you want this to be like super low key, casual, quiet, it's um, pre-registering. It's super easy to set up on a website for this. And you can even set it up so that if you do charge for your you pick for people to arrive or there's a parking fee, you can set it up there on your website for people to prepay all of these fees ahead of time. Um, and it, it, it lends itself also, if there is any kind of money transaction planned, it makes keeping people moving and flowing through the check-in line and um, the parking area so much faster because you don't have to exchange money at all. It's all been taken care of ahead of time. So during COVID, this exchange of money has, has certainly been an issue, but I think even after this is all past us, um, the ease of not having to deal with money transactions on the day of your UPIC, except for maybe anything extra they're buying or the buckets or bags they're buying. But as far as entrance fees and parking, if you can take care of that ahead of time, it'll just be easier for, for you and your staff. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is having a, and this may seem so obvious, but um, it's how you set up your welcoming table. That's really key. So having an information booth or table is, you know, everyone's going to do that. That just makes sense. But you really want to have a tent over it. You want some signage there. Again, it's about managing people. And instead of them looking or looking lost or not sure where to go, you can keep people moving quickly by just having a sign there that says information booth. And when they arrive, just give them the basic information. You know, there's the bathrooms, the, the, the fields back there, our staff is waiting for you. Just answer sort of basic, I'm sorry, not answer basic questions, just give them some basic information. And then hand them a sheet of frequently asked questions. And the reason I bring this up is because the first two years we didn't do this and people were standing there coming up to the table, telling us who they were so we could check them off. And then asking endless questions and the line behind them was getting longer and longer and longer. And the staff person at the information desk didn't want to cut the people off. And it, it just got a bit tangled. So, you know, when people arrive, um, what they want is to just get out in that field or into that orchard. They're, they're anxious, they're super excited. So you want to keep that line moving. And that frequently asked question page, I think was, Jam like that saved us repeating the same thing a million times. And um, the other thing that I wanted to uh, talk about, which is you know, I'm just checking the clock because I want to, I promised Penny I wouldn't go over. So I have 10 minutes, but um, here's the thing that I think is what's going to make or break the successful you pick, and that is having staff on hand to help you. This is something that you really want to line up three or four months before your event. Maybe it's something you even want to talk about to potential people um, when you first come up with your idea. There is no way to make this easy on yourself and manage groups of people if you don't have help. And whatever help you think you need, double it. And I say that because one, there's always more to do than you could possibly imagine once people are involved. And the second is because oftentimes the people that you were relying on to come help you, manager you pick, we'll call at the last minute and somebody's not gonna be able to make it. It can be quite legitimate, you know, something's come up in their, their personal life and they have to back out from their, their promise to you. But it's always best to line up more help for that day than you think. So you want help in the parking lot, you want help at the information desk, you also want to think about having staff that really this may seem a waste, but I promise you just having one or two people whose job is to walk around your farm because visitors to farms will go under the caution tape, go past privacy signs, open doors to buildings, climb on tractors. They do all these things that you would never imagine they would do. And it's nice to have at least two people designated who can walk 
around the property and just nicely and gently redirect people back to the main activity. Um, and to keep an eye on kids who sometimes, bless their little hearts, love to open animal pens or chase the dog or climb a ladder. And so, you know, it's really important to kind of think about those side issues to having people on your property that have nothing to do with the UPIC at all, but people do wander. And um, I have even had people walking in my house. I've had people literally let open up our corral and our goats and chickens were flying everywhere. It was chaos. It was kids, you know, they're four years old, five, they don't know better, but um, that area of our farm was at least four acres away from the UPIC. So those little kids were trotting and wandering and exploring with or without their parents. And, you know, suddenly something that never crossed my mind to be worried about was the focus of the afternoon. Um, the other thing you want to make sure you have experienced staff out in the field or out in the orchard. These are the people who are going to ask sir the questions about how these crops are grown, um, how to pick or harvest them. I know every year we have to spend a lot of time teaching people how to pick the lavender. It seems intuitive, but if you've never been out in the field before, you've never cut flowers, it's not something you would necessarily know how to do. Um, you, your staff people are also really the ones who can run and go get extra buckets if people need it or bring a chair out for somebody if they're too tired. You know, there's a lot of really um, important elements that come up in the middle of the day out in the field. And you as the owner, you're sort of the overseer of this whole event day. You really don't want to get stuck in one part of the, the project and not able to move around and make sure it's all functioning. So all these staff people are really key to making sure you have a successful day. And then um, the other thing I want to mention is don't forget about um, taking good care of your staff. So make sure they have breaks. Make sure they um, have some time in the shade if it's a hot day. Make sure there's plenty of water available for them. Anything you can do to make them feel incredibly cared about. And yes, it's another group of people you have to show a lot of concern for as well as your visitors, but you want to sort of cultivate a relationship with these people so that they will come back every year and help you. And this is how you get to sort of build your UPIC enterprise over time not by starting over again, but by kind of building on what you've created. Um, I still have about five minutes. Um, and I just wanted to say a couple of short little things. Um, Penny is absolutely correct. You definitely want to check with your county and make sure that um, you have all your permits and requirements so that you can do this you pick. Um, it's oftentimes really successful to collaborate with nonprofits if you're doing a UPIC. Um, sometimes that um, added uh, partnership really inspires people to come out and um, support you even more because they know you're doing something sort of of service and, and altruistic to help a, a nonprofit. Um, insurance is imperative. Don't forget about that. Um, I think that that might be discussed a little more in this webinar, but um, you have to have really good insurance. You would want to make sure that um, nothing um, comes back to bite you later. And um, again, people are outside. So anything from a bee bite, bee sting, or a snake, or falling, tripping in a cow hole, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a million issues, but you want to make sure that you can be have peace of mind that day while people are walking around your property. And um, yeah, I have four minutes left, but I think that I've kind of be talked and, and got everything out that I really wanted to say that I thought was sort of important about managing people. And um, I think that all the other elements of your UP will really fall into place if you, and, and you will feel like you've had a successful afternoon if you, if you know that you were able to manage the crowds that are coming out to your place. I hope this was helpful. Well, thank you very much, Alexis. That was great. And if any of you, if any of you have um, questions that you for any of the speakers, please put them into your um, into the Q and A, and we will answer them at the end. Unless if there's any questions, are there any questions for Alexis yet, Camille? 
No, we don't have any questions right now. Okay. Well, then we will hand it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Lashbrook, owner of Riverdance Farm. Okay. My screen has gone black for a little bit. Do you guys see me or just the C? Do you see my We see screen? a C. Okay. So somehow, I don't know if Tamir can, um, as I, I signed back in just as a participant. Can you make it so? Uh, yes, let me in there twice. make it I, so my yes, computer can, I otherwise to, I can't do the slides. Sorry. I got am it. going to give got me it. a minute. You got it, come here. I think uh, it says rejoining. Okay. I mean, I was watching through this, but it didn't look like okay. I wasn't being We are going so. to um, make you a co-host, so then you'll be able to um, you'll okay. share. It's just went black out of nowhere. <laughs> I don't know what the problem was. So um, can you share your screen now, Cindy? Um, I think you're still maybe doing my phone. You see where I'm attached with my computer? Okay, I'll try the other. Uh... Yeah. Let's see. You're hearing me? Okay. There you are. Now I see you. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's better. Okay. I'm turning off the the video on my phone, and so it should be the one where I'm looking straight at you. Is that there? Uh, no, we don't see it. I'm trying to. I'm watching you guys. Okay. I, it was well. Okay. I am going to. Uh, I mean, I can try to. I can just talk, but I was hoping to have my pictures. Yeah, started. I know you have great pictures. Okay, let me let me try one more thing. Let's start my video. Okay, somebody's asked me to start my video. It should do it. Okay, good. Okay, and while I'm still stumbling around, uh, maybe I can um, give kind of an intro. Um, this is Cindy. Okay, okay, go ahead. Are you sharing your screen? I'm trying to get to that point. Return to meeting. All right. Well, let me tell you about my favorite farm, which is one of my favorite farms, excuse me, is Riverdance Farm. And Riverdance Farm in Livingston is awesome. And Cindy and her husband, Bill, grow organic cherries and organic blueberries for you pick. And uh, whenever you, how's the sharing going? Are you there? Um, at least I can see my screen, share screen, okay. Share the screen. Okay, so the organic berries, the organic blueberries and the organic cherries come right round, come ripe round about Memorial Day. And on Memorial Day for on that weekend for years, Cindy's been running this great festival called the Pick and Gather at Riverdance Farm, where everybody comes out and picks organic blueberries. There you go, Cindy, you're on. Okay, I'm trying to get to the button that does a slideshow. It's being top, covered, top. covered by the top of the other thing. Just that, oh, there we go. They're right up on the top, yes, yeah, slideshow. And yeah, this, the other toolbar from, was covering it. Yeah, and then you go from beginning. Okay. Over to the far, far left from beginning. Uh, okay. to, uh, Got it. There. Okay. And then my glasses are, you get older and I need trifocal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I think I got it. Um, okay. So back around 2000, there was a um, ecological farming association and CAF and some other organizations were part of it started. They wanted to put a little more um, focus on Central Valley farmers. You know, we're, we're not so she, she here. Um, it's not, it's not a, uh, Santa Rosa or Napa or, or Santa Cruz. But um, so the, the Heartland Festival, and that was, you know, quite a few local farmers and things. And what, what we ended up with about the third year, we had our blueberries were just getting going. And we also, I, I worked on some watershed issues and with the RCD. So having a Merced River Fair was important. We could do it at the same time because we have access to the river. So it was about 2003, I believe, we had the first, um, maybe 2004, our first Sunday, we were the, the kind of the third day 
of the festival was at our farm. And went on like that for a couple of years and then things kind of went away, people's interest and, and one of the original hosts was kind of tired of everything. So we ended up having the whole event at our place for a few years and then it just became a, a individual farm event um, after that, although we do work with nonprofits. So this was a, a piece of artwork that somebody did that we decided we were, um, people working with me wanted to copy kind of the Napa Mustard Festival and they had new art every year. But we haven't done new art, art every year because this is actually what people recognize. If you hand them a flyer with this, they go, oh yeah, this, I've been there, I wanna go. So we keep this little kind of primitive art piece as our, as our flyer. Okay, is it gonna move? Hmm. Okay, it's off this way. Why is it not going? Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so our property. Can you guys can you guys see my cursor or not? Not. Yes, we see your cursor. Okay, good. Okay, so our our land starts on this end here, and follows the river around like this. Um, so part of the reason, there's two reasons we named the Farm River Dance. One was we moved in to this first part in late 96, and that was the first year that the public TV had the River Dance um, dance troupe. Um, the other one, this piece here, the river definitely dances around at this the deepest little horseshoe bend on, on the Lower Merced River. And also my sister was able to do a whole dance concentration in her whole career as a teacher. So it just kind of ended up being river dance farms. Um, and so, but mostly the festival areas, there are houses on this end, but the festival areas here, and then that's some bottom ground. We bought this in 2000, planted blueberries and cherries the next year. Um, and we have more mixed fruits and stuff now, but um, we were able to um, just open that up. We've got some space that we use just for events of a few pictures we, and we have good river access in two places there and here Let's see if it'll move now there we go i just wanted this is we're closest to livingston which is right on we're about two miles from highway 99 so we're on the river we feel like we're kind of out in the boonies but we're fairly good access to most people coming and we do get quite a few people that drive two hours or so from Sacramento, Santa Cruz, Bay Area, San Jose, that'll come for festival, but for you pick. And um, we were pretty surprised. There's our little little sign there that we stick there for a few days. They move people to, so they know which way to turn. Um, this, was, this was our festival that didn't happen last year. It would have been our 16th annual in 2020. And we had to, to not do that type of gathering. But um, about a week before this would have been, usually it's about the third week of May that we start getting fruit ripening, blueberries and cherries. And people were just going crazy to get out. So people that knew us were, without even hardly doing any outreach were calling and saying, can we come to the farm? Can we come to the farm? So we just made sure almost all of those, those rules and recommendations that Penny brought up, you know, they were common sense. And we, we put most of that in place. And I didn't have, we'll have a, a website better set up this year for uh, appointments. Most of them went through my phone, through, through talking to me or text, and we put them on the calendar. Um, but that, I just, I kind of needed to get in touch with people this year. That was one of the benefits is I got more individual um, um, access to the people that cared about the farm and the fruit. Um, but now we need to get even a little more efficient and let people help. But that, this is kind of our regular poster. Um, that's, that's Mahabi's kind of picturesque. And we usually, the hay rides did not go this year either, except for a couple uh, events where we just had family or groups that were, um, you know, COVID, COVID used to each other. So that pretty much sat this year. This, this just shows kids, kids that eat fruit. They don't have smiles, this next guy does, but 
he was happy. I didn't realize it. Oh, there we go. Um, it's always good on that. When we do have the festival, um, we normally have vendors. And again, Penny, Penny and, and her partner make this wonderful clay thing, do all this, this great um, activity. So we've been really lucky that they've brought that to the, to the kids, um, all that hands-on stuff. So that's just been- yeah. we, we love it. We love all the families that come back every year. All the families from all these small towns come all from around there and they come we let them do clay and it's all sorts of fun. That's my other life. Yeah, yeah. So we do, we have yeah, lots of local people and want to make sure we have even more. And, you know, we just pull communities together that care about this stuff. You also find out a lot about um, kind of different cultures or people from different countries that really care about UPIC. Um, you tend to get concentrations of, of people from the, the, the Near East and, uh, Russian and Ukrainian people, we get a lot of those. It just it seems to be important in their culture. So you just, you know, you get to um, visit different parts of the world vicariously a little bit with this. That was when our lavender batch, we kind of redid a lavender block, but um, up by a barn. Um, we were selling some commercially down that market kind of fell apart. But um, we do have the river. There's been times, um, you can go either way. During our festival, we've we've had either rafting or kayak companies that, that offer that. Or we've also we've had some worked with some rafting companies and said, Do you want this to be a stop for, for any of your adventures? Another hayride didn't really need that. Um, when we do have music, we have a pretty good lineup of mostly local folks, a few headliners, not Things most people would understand, but ones that have a following. Our stage, the back of the stage, looks out at the at the orchard and blueberries. Um, try to get other related sort of activities there. These people are um, they you know they work with the uh, um, Leave No Trace and. Let's see, the other thing I wanted to bring up was the permits we do use. When we do a big festival, we, we go to the county planning and get a, a permit for that event. We, we did not do that this year just for the, the UPIX because we weren't you know, drawing in a huge amount of folks. No matter what you're doing, if you're bringing in any food from the outside, including honey from like a honey or jam from somebody that's producing that, if you have any food that's being um, served, got a few pictures there. Um, it, you have to, um, you know, you have to have a permit from Environmental Health to have that be legal. Part of the reason I wanted this snow cone was uh, we got we got our snow cone provider to use either all organic and or made some concentrated fruit juices from our fruit to do special, special snow cones. And you can do that sometimes with your vendors, you know, make sure that they're using local meat or organic this, organic that. And, and a lot of them are open or especially stuff from your own farm. And we, we hope by fall of this year, we may do in May, late May is early June is when the first fruits are there. And we may try to do more than we did last year. We will probably have at least one food booth with good protocol and we'll, for people to stay social distance. And um, we may do, may do our river fair again, which we, could, we have organizations and, and agencies that work with fish and wildlife and they do educational things and they can do the demos. We can spread them out farther along the river and make sure that that, um, you know, most of these people have done a lot now over this last year, so they know what they need to do to stay safe and keep people safe. But, you know, it's with all this homeschooling, if we can help add to that with place-based learning, that's what we're gonna do. And we may be doing that May 22nd this year. We'll see, how to stay loose. Um, as just using using this was a fall like a, a salad we had with the persimmons and pomegranates during that season some greens it was kind of how we tried to um, do that 
That's a Brazilian barbecue and not a very good picture. Um, just a couple of shots of you pickers. You know, this, this is great for COVID. This was probably more than we'd want at one time during COVID. So we were taking phone calls. We were trying to have well, probably no more than about six different parties, you know, related family parties at one time to keep everybody separated. Look at those cherries. That's our normal pack box that goes out, but some people like to buy them that way. Um, that goes out to through veritable vegetable now. That one's still there. Um, we don't put ladders out in the UPIC because of liability, but people find interesting ways to uh, get up a little higher, lifting their kids. That's on them. Um, we'll normally have some stuff pre-picked and at, at this point we will have them also pre-bagged into one pound or five pound um, bags so people aren't picking through there. Ways to carry. We do have some strawberries with strawberries. I'm not very professional at making strawberries so they, they come and go when they're ready. But they, almost always during that first uh, blueberry cherry is a good time for plenty of strawberries to be there. We work with some neighbor farms. This is um, from Kashiwase Farms. Anybody who goes to the farmer's markets in the Bay Area, they do about 30 of those, but he's real nearby. So some of the fruit we don't grow, we go pick up from them to have available. Didn't do much of that this year. We're gonna you know, look at that again for, um, for 2021. Uh, wash stations, it's like fruit washing and our hand washing. And we had a lot more, I, I had some more pictures I was gonna put on, but we did spend a little more money with our porta potty company. And we definitely had, we always have hand washing stations, but we had a few more of those. Plus there's a few that we, we make ourselves out of uh, um, things we have available on the farm. So that there's just plenty of, plenty of places to wash your hands. And we bought hand sanitizer and had the big tubs out. And where we are using the, the, the portable toilets or any toilets, we made sure we had a cleaning protocol for those. Um, oh, that's staff when I'm talking about staff, you'd have to have, to have a few, few more people just for the cleaning part. Um, we do a fall you pick, we're pretty sure this year this was the first year we did, it was 2017. It was just, it was a good crop. I only have like a row of persimmons and a row of pomegranates. We've expanded a little bit since then. And our walnuts come down right about that time. Um, the six acres is all we have there. Um, but especially this first year, it was just amazing how many people came. Um, we were surprised. It was, you know, we probably made 18,000 over two weekends, which is pretty good for the, the level of what we've done. Haven't quite made that yet again, but, um, but uh, it, it was enough to pay a couple of ranch payments and, and was definitely a lot of fun. There's some uh, hachia persimmons, most of what we grow is for you, pomegranates. I think I got a lot of on the tree pictures. There's a little boy looking at some there's some Fuyu's hanging up close. And the, the kids are so much fun. And most of the parents are just really good with their kids, watching them and still yelling, letting them experience that. That's some of my crew in here. Um, it's good to have, again, people are sitting here, but this year we also had, um, you pick, we still had, we had some blackberries and kind of the end of the blueberries, but the elderberries were ripe. And it was an amazing elderberry year. And most of our elderberries are, are just natural or they grew. Um, we, we added a few to some hedgerows, but there were so many that we had some, um, some elderberry classes on how to do elderberry syrup tonic, especially with COVID, it's supposed to help chase away diseases. So this is, I just kind of put this picture in to remind me to talk about that. And that again was, was um, reservation only. We kept people separated fairly well. Um, had the people that were 
passing out fruit or honey or whatever had a had methods to do that and with cleaning in between. Excuse me, sir, you have five yes. more minutes. Okay, okay. Um, workshops again. Um, we also have the the river. Uh, it's we we're not quite as as organized and um, you know it's it's seventy three acres and there's the edges are are not all that clear so we just try to make sure we definitely had a, I was going to go try to find a picture of the big board you know, when people were standing in line to come in there was a big board of of instructions also on paper we had the what to do and what not to do with covid um, we still had people picking into the buckets but every time they came in and um, we weighed them they were washed dipped and washed and and um, a disinfecting sort of thing. We're also certified organic, so we have to be not, you know, we have to be careful whatever we use on the farm. So that was interesting. We did use, um, didn't require people to wear masks out in the field, except on the busiest days. Um, but but it, if we all wore them in where we were measuring fruit and and selling and talking to them, and if people got too close and then we had that there. We also did kind of a double table, a double table wide between the, the person weighing and the, the people that brought their fruit in. But there's two good places to go do picnics and things. And we just you know, re recommended that people find their place far enough away from other people. Um, that's one place. Um, the other thing we do is work with, with students sometimes. So we do field days and, and lessons about wildlife and farming. And there's some more. And then we also, sometimes we get those students to volunteer and especially where we're working with them, um, with kind of restoring some of the native riparian stuff. We get some good work done there, gratis, cleaning up. That's my husband and I. Happy day. Um, kind of the end of the day. Um, I know I had some pictures that I was going to add in that had a little more information. Um, but just mostly this year, we just, again, I was just, we were really amazed at, you know, we, every day we had you pickers where normally during festival it was two or three days. Um, it was easy to space them out, even on the days where I was a little worried I had too many signed up. It was easy to space them out um, with what we were doing. Um, people were so thankful. I was worried that they would be missing kind of the circus Disneyland effect of, you know, festival you usually have a lot more going on. And at least where people's, you know, hearts were, souls were, um, they did not mind. They just liked being out in nature this year. So it's, it's going to change what we do somewhat too in that we will maybe not try to clump everything up so much at once. I'd probably do more of a three-week um, festival with different concentrations, different weekends. And the other thing we do, and we can still do that too with COVID, is we, we, we have our walnut orchard, especially in the spring, nothing's much going on there other than they're growing and that's good shady stuff and it's right near the river so we have campsites in there where people are able to camp and stay there and that's something I feel like we can still do safely um, so we're probably going to concentrate a little bit more on opening that up again last year was a little freaky but it was it was worthwhile and we learned some stuff and again I got to talk more directly with the people visiting the farm and that was that was psychic income for me so that worked out well. Um, Penny, I know I missed a few things that are important. Do, can you think of anything I should have said here since I missed my other picture? No, my... no, except I would encourage everybody to check out the Pick and Gather. It's a wonderful experience. It'll come back. And uh, Cindy's farm is beautiful with the river right there. And uh, I really appreciate you coming to talk to us today. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was beautiful. Um, uh, 
We do have, I didn't know if Penny, if you want, um, there was one question that uh, Alexis answered uh, in the in the box, but maybe you can review that for us, Alexis, if you don't mind, because I think that was those were good questions and um, maybe not okay. everybody. Got them. And what um, was the question? Uh, the question was, um, how do you handle uh, children holding SNPs or, or cutting equipment when you're at a UPIC? And the other question was, um, what is a fair um, wage to pay staff? So um, at our farm and probably at others with children, you can often with small children give them plastic scissors mm -hmm. and so that they can feel that they're participating. But really we tell all the parents who come with kids that the parents are responsible for handling any, um, any pruning uh, equipment or, or scissors or, or snips that we hand out for mm -hmm. them to cut the lavender. And um, we just have some plastic things available for small children who often don't understand safety and they want to be more interactive, but older kids understand and we leave that up to their parents to be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. um, what we pay our staff is what we feel is fair and equitable wage for the day. So um, basic, uh, there's sort of a basic level that we pay out at $15 an hour for just doing um, some work, uh, like walking around the farm and making sure people aren't um, wandering or clean up or handing out information, working in the parking lot. And we pay $20 an hour to um, people who are doing uh, much more uh, uh, interaction with the customers. So information booth, um, managing customers, anybody who uh, was working on the marketing and, and set up for the event. Um, mm -hmm. So we have two tiers, but everybody should be paid a fair wage, we think. And in agriculture where we are, wages run between 15 and $20 um, to hire ag workers. So we mm -hmm. just break it down into what the jobs are, what's, you know, and uh, we pay out like that. And we also, we also make sure that um, if there's food vendors on the farm that they have uh, food. And if not, we try to just make sure there's plenty of water and fruit available for them. Right now with COVID, we aren't having any food trucks on the property. So we're trying to make sure that there's some refreshments there for our staff. So that's how we take care of it here. I hope that answered the question. And we've had, we have a few, well, they're not really volunteers, but we have some people that are more than willing to work some hours and trade for you know some of the fruit or the UPIC products. So. Um, somehow I lost my, no. Oh, I'm talking through the other one. So, we can, you know, there, there's kind of even, you know, a fair trade between what they're able to take home and the time they spend. So we definitely hire staff. And we're about $2 an hour less in general in the Central Valley than, uh, than the Bay Area and Sonoma and places like that. So... I mean, this year, well, fourteen dollars I think is minimum wage, and we definitely won't pay less than that. Um, and on up to eighteen or twenty. Okay. Thank you. We have Thank another you. question. Oh yeah. Uh, also from Stephanie, and she asks, "Do you think?" Uh, and this is for both of you. Uh, do you think it's a good idea or necessary to have a liability waiver? I don't know which. Who wants to chime in first? Oh, we, we, well, we, we, with the campers, we have them sign a little thing. And then anybody that brings a pet on the property has something they have to sign. Um, it wouldn't be a bad idea. And we, we've done it for some educational events. So far, our insurance company hasn't required it. And with our insurance, so far, we keep everything related to you pick or picking up harvest because we, we have an additional insurance we pay, but we haven't had to buy a step for a long time once we figured this out, like a separate event insurance. We just pay them about three, $400 a year more and it covers people that are on the farm for you pick and harvest. But um, I, I, 
a waiver like that would be a good idea, especially if it kind of comes with the rules of the, you know, the, the common sense rules for being there on your farm. And they get to keep that part maybe and you keep the part that they sign. Um, Alexa. Yeah, I think it is a great idea. Um, for everything else I do at Soul Food Farm, I do have liability waivers signed. Um, we haven't done it for the U pick, but I think we will this year. And it's so easy to add it if where when people go into register mm -hmm. to come to the farm and pick their times uh, that they they want to to arrive. You can have a a, a link there that takes them, you know, a hyperlink where they can click on that and they can see the liability form and they can sign it. And uh, I think it can just be so easy to do that. And essential to do that. Like the fact that we haven't done it for the last three you picked was probably just, um, I don't know, we just didn't think about it, but it, it makes yeah. total sense. I think because we have such good insurance for the event, we, we thought maybe that was enough, but I, I don't think it really is enough anymore. Especially when you have so many variables on a farm and nothing here is childproof or set up for seniors, you know. So right. it's, it's good to have a bit of a, a backup there. Yes, Saying we are. That people business. understand what they're coming into on a farm. Yeah, we always explain this isn't Disneyland. This is not controlled, you know. And we do have we have like ground squirrel holes and. And weeds that might make them itch, and you know, there's things that can happen. So, liability is important. You just want to keep it as as common sense as possible. I think, you know, not not a million little lines of fine writing. Thank least. you very much. We are Thank at you. the four o'clock moment, so. Um... Yeah, I I'd, I'd like to I'd like to thank our our. Um, Awesome farmer speakers, Alexis and Cindy. Thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and experience with us. And I'd also like to encourage the, everybody to check out our webinar series on our website here on the UC Serif website. Um, and uh, the next webinar will be um, March 22nd, and it will be about best practices for safe and healthy and profitable farm stands. So we'll be talking about farm stands on Monday, March 22nd. Good. That is it for today. So thank you all for joining us. And as soon as this ends, you're going to see a little survey. And I would really encourage you to fill in the little evaluation survey because it helps us a lot to know how we're doing and who you are and um, what you think of our webinar. So thank you very much. And that's it. Thank you. And Thank you, Penny. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.